Okay. Our, our next speaker is Matthew Hutchins. He, Matt is a research scientist for UNC Asheville's National Environmental Modeling and Analysis Center, or NEMAC. Do you say NEMAC? Uh, where he serves as lead on projects related to environmental change, such as issues dealing with I the impacts from climate-related hazards and extreme weather events, wildfire, and other environmental threats. Matt combines his knowledge, <clears throat> excuse me, in environmental science, climate science, and decision science with technical skills to support groups and communities in planning and making in informed decisions. He's, he specializes in vulnerability and risk assessment, geographic information systems, and web-based te technologies for decision support. Matt holds a BS in environmental studies and a master's degree with a concentration in climate change and from and society from UNC Asheville. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Amy, and uh, thanks for having me in the session today. Uh, my name is Matt Hutchins, and I'm with the UNC Asheville's NEMAC. Uh, we're a relatively small group um, in Asheville of about 11 folks, and over the past, um, let's see, let me get my presentation up. Over the past couple of years, we've been working with uh, communities on building resilience to climate-related hazards and threats. And so what I wanted to do uh, today is to highlight some of the process that we uh, work with communities on building resilience. And in particular, I wanted to highlight uh, or give some of the background of what we mean by climate resilience um, and highlight some of the ways that we're applying some of the concepts, concepts of vulnerability and risk at the local scale, um, and also highlight how we're using some information to support communities on developing policy options for dealing with climate-related threats. So I also want to recognize my uh, team, my colleagues Jim Fox and Karen Rogers, um, and also uh, our student intern William Clark, who's actually here at the conference. Our intern's been a very integral part of, of the team. So all this work comes from uh, working over the last two or three years on the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit. And so that's a piece of work in collaboration with NOAA that we've uh, helped to develop a tool for communities to come to to get information about how to adapt um, and build resilience to climate-related hazards. And so this is a, at the website toolkit.climate.gov. Um, and so this tool has a collection of case studies that show what communities are doing to build resilience to climate-related threats, um, and also a process that communities can work through um, for building resilience, a planning process. And so that's a part that we've worked with um, developing. And so this is a five-step process that you can see on the right side here. Um, and, and part of this process is actually us working with communities and figuring out how communities need to work through this process to apply at the local level. So we define resilience as the capacity to prevent, withstand, respond to, and recover from a dis uh, disruption. And a little bit more about um, how we work with communities. We usually engage communities on a series of workshops. We work with uh, municipalities and sustainability managers, and that's kind of a key point that we found in this work, that sustainability managers have been really key for us to coordinate with, and sustainability managers and communities have been shown to um, be really integral of putting together a resilience team for working through this process. Um, two groups that we've worked with over the last uh, few years, one is the Southeast Sustainability Directors Network, and so that's a group of the sustainability managers throughout the southeast, uh, 10 cities actually, um, and also the city of Asheville. And we've worked the most with the city of Asheville, and I'll be highlighting some of the work we've done with them, uh, I think, the most through this talk. Um, but the idea through the resilience planning is that it should be able to integrate with existing efforts, such as comprehensive plans, hazard mitigation efforts, and sustainability plans. So we really don't see this as... Um, anything that would replace any of these existing efforts or practices taking place, but that would complement these and be able to integrate. Um, another key part of the planning process is that it should be transparent and data informed. And so I'll talk a little bit about how we try to do that 
Um, and this image just shows an example of one of our workshops. One of the first parts that we start working with communities on is thinking about community assets. And we um, think about community assets in two uh, primary ways. One is infrastructure, and the other is the services that those assets and infrastructure provides. And so that's the two ways that we kind of characterize what we mean by community assets. So these include anything from uh, critical infrastructure, buildings, roads, um, natural resources, and areas. Um, and the part of the process that we start with communities on is thinking about how these assets could be impacted by climate-related threats or extreme weather events. So that brings us really to the first uh, step of this process of exploring climate threats. Um, and one key thing to point out here is how we consider climate threats. And we break it out into thinking about them as climate stressors that influence a threat. And so climate stressors are events like an extreme precipitation event, drought, temperature variability. And so those are climate stressors that influence or have a um, cause and effect on a threat occurrence. And so the threats include things like flooding, landslide events, water shortages, uh, wildfire due to drought, or, or heat waves from temperature variability. And so we think about um, these threats in terms of how communities have been um, impacted in the past. And so a big important part of this is understanding the, the existing institutional knowledge um, of city staff have about how climate events have affected them in the past. And we look at the uh, U.S. National Climate Assessment for looking at current trends and projections for how climate stressors could be changing in the future and how that could be changing the frequency of climate threats. For some of these climate threats, we can delineate these or use um, you know, GIS hazard areas to help inform or define the threats. And so here's just three examples of those. Uh, the first one, the threat of flooding. Uh, we use the North Carolina flood mapping programs, uh, floodplain layers. Um, for landslides, uh, using uh, NCDEQ's debris flow pathways. And so this is a uh, data set uh, created by the state uh, geologists. And so this, the debris flow pathways show the potential for a landslide event, where that would occur and where that event would flow. And so it's kind of this hazard area for landslides, potential for landslides. And the third one here is showing the threat of wildfire using the Southern Group of State Foresters burn probability um, data layer. And so it, it combines several factors for the probability, uh, a burn probability. So after we've started talking about community assets and how we define threats and threat areas, we start um, applying this conceptual framework for assessing vulnerability and risk. So this is a framework that is in, um, in line with the IPCC um, summary for, for policymakers and also the concepts that are used in the National Climate Assessment. And so these are the concepts that we then apply at the local level. To do this, we rely on a GIS platform of spatial SQL. And um, I won't go into incredible detail on this. Uh, Spatial SQL for me uh, in using GIS has been really transformative and, and so I get really excited about Spatial SQL but I refrain from actually showing snippets of code or SQL um, but it's something I really do enjoy and it's been very powerful in using GIS. And so we use Spatial SQL for uh, defining and, uh, and considering these different aspects of vulnerability and risk and so I'll, I'll describe each of these a little bit more. Um, so we used a, uh, we rely on a PostGIS platform, and so that's a Postgres database with PostGIS extension enabled. And so the first part of this process, like I just mentioned, is doing spatial intersections between the assets that are represented spatially and the threats. And in doing that, we uh, define this concept of exposure. The next kind of part of this process is uh, using what's called database views. And so views are representations of data. Um, and we, we do what we call um, ordinal classifications. And so we actually work with the city staff 
through these workshops on developing rule sets that are applied through these database views to explore the concepts of potential impact, vulnerability, and risk. And I'll describe that a little bit more. But then the last and probably most important part of this is the ability to do this and provide multi-scale summaries of vulnerability and risk to the communities and quantify this at different spatial scales. And these are the products that are directly used for the development of policy options. So I'll step through a couple of these. Um, the first concept here of exposure, looking at an exposure is defined as the as assets in harm's way. Um, and so we, we look at exposure at the unit of the asset. And so in this case, um, looking at parcels, but it also may be bridges or roads, individual bridges and roads. And so this map shows um, parcels that are exposed, commercial property parcels that are exposed to the threat of flooding, for example. And so we consider the entire extent of this hazard area. And for, so in this case, um, the 500-year floodplain is our um, kind of metric that we're using to define exposure for commercial properties to flooding. And so the gray parcels are the ones uh, showing in that spatial intersection. And the darker gray are the building footprints within the parcels. So the next major concept here is uh, the concept of vulnerability. And so vulnerability is defined by two elements. The first one is potential impact. And so this is the degree to which an asset is potentially affected by the threat. And so any parcels that are exposed then are evaluated for this potential impact. And some references, uh, or some people refer to this as sensitivity. And so there's different levels of sensitivity or different levels of potential impact that a um, asset would have to a threat. And that's determined by um, the type of asset that is and the type of service that asset provides. And that's the way we think about um, different levels of impact if that threat were to occur. The other concept uh, to define vulnerability or a different element is adaptive capacity. And so adaptive capacity is the asset's ability to cope with that potential impact. And so with that, we um, look at the asset's ability to cope in terms of physical ability. So in, the, in terms of flooding, we actually look at some of the building um, development practices in terms of flood proofing that the um, building or code has um, compliant with. And so it's these two concepts together that inform vulnerability at this parcel level. So another way we think about vulnerability is potential impact that's offset by its adaptive capacity. So this is that same map of commercial parcels with these different levels we refer to as ordinal levels of vulnerability, uh, low, medium, and high. The higher ones are the uh, darker uh, red parcels that you're seeing there on the map. So the next concept is risk. And so risk is defined by both the probability or likelihood of the threat occurring and also the consequence, uh, the general consequence of that threat occurring. And so we refer to this as a risk scoping exercise because we're not quantifying <laughs> risk. We're generally looking at levels of risk. So here's a couple, uh, um, this is looking at flooding again. And here's some criteria for looking at different levels of risk. And we use the different floodplain areas of the floodway the 100-year floodplain and the 500-year floodplain. And so the 100-year and 500-year floodplain look at different annualized probabilities of flooding uh, occurring. And so we use that for determining these levels of risk. And for consequence, a couple examples here is looking at the structure itself, whether a building structure would be impacted by a, a threat event or just the parcel itself, the land only, not including the building. And so we combine these concepts together, the concepts of vulnerability and risk. Um, and so vulnerability, again, it, it's describing the susceptibility of, uh, that the asset has to the threat, if that threat were to occur. And the risk is providing this foundation of probability of that threat actually occurring. And so by looking at them together, we look at, at different thresholds, different uh, levels of risk thresholds in terms of susceptibility. And so the, metric, the matrix on the right side uh, shows um, what we 
what's referred to as a risk matrix approach for looking at these two concepts. And the, uh, for instance, in the upper right quadrant is where you have the highest risk and highest vulnerability uh, combined. And so the numbers there are the actual numbers of parcels that meet those criteria. And so in this case, this is again commercial properties. Uh, there is 181 in this example that are both high levels of vulnerability and high risk. And so you can see how uh, those can be described on the left-hand side. So the high vulnerability, high risk are business-related structures built before 1980, and so before there was any floodplain development ordinance in place that are in the floodway. Um, the high vulnerability, low risk, so that's the top left quadrant, are again business-related structures, commercial properties built before 1980 as well, but in the 500-year floodplain, so you have a different risk level associated with those. We also look at, um, at the relatively moderate to high levels of vulnerability and risk. And so the uh, dark black solid line that is um, portioning off a section of that matrix is what we refer to as the um, assets with the medium to high vulnerability and risk. In this case, there are 415 of those commercial properties that fit that, um, those categories. What this allows us to do then is start considering future change as well. And so a couple examples of future change. One is uh, looking at extreme precipitation trends. And so the graph on the top right shows uh, an extreme precipitation index for the Asheville area. And so this is looking at the number of your heaviest 1% rainfall events uh, since 1949. Um, and so there's, a, there's been a slight increasing trend in those. <laughs> Another example of future change is uh, development change, and that's a big one for the Asheville area. And so the map on the bottom right is showing recent increase in impervious surfaces. So these are a climate stressor, the precipitation, and a non-climate stressor, the uh, development impervious surface. And we consider how those different stressors could potentially influence um, a greater risk to flooding. And so when we think about that conceptually, we think about and consider where assets are already vulnerable and may be in a low level of risk currently, but could be moving into a higher risk category due to some of these factors, some of these this future change that's taking place. And so the other thing that we do to um, provide information for the communities and through this process is looking at different planning scales uh, or different scales for planning purposes. And so one that we use here is a census block groups. And so we take these, um, the results of these assets and their levels of vulnerability and risk and then look at them at uh, the census block group scale. And so we quantify the number of those that are in those categories. And so those 415 parcels are spread throughout the Asheville area. And so the map on the right uh, shows those census block group um, areas that cover the entire extent of the city of Asheville and the colors are associated with um, the number of parcels that meet those medium to high vulnerability and risk categories. So the darker red are showing where census block groups uh, where you have at least 15 commercial properties in that high vulnerability and risk category. And we also um, and through a, these workshops, we actually start testing how this information can be used. And that's something that we're still working on. Um, we provide summaries along with narratives. And so this shows a part of the report that we are providing for the city of Asheville that summarize the information about vulnerability and risk along with the criteria. And so the criteria are on the right side, um, the criteria that we developed with the city staff uh, for looking at both vulnerability and risk. From this uh, you know, SQL platform that we've uh, created, we can also create summaries just to um, provide for each asset citywide. And so these are showing, showing city scale summaries for vulnerability to flooding for a few different assets. And so on the top left are showing commercial properties, um, 600 parcels that are exposed in the city 
and then their distribution of vulnerability in the graph um, there as well. On the top right are showing residents and residential properties. Um, over 1,500 residential properties exposed, and uh, that represents 3.7% of all residential properties citywide, and the graph showing the distribution of vulnerability for those. And the bottom left are community services, and the bottom right um, roads and the service of mobility. And so those are being expressed as a number of road miles that are vulnerable. And so a part of what we also work with on through these workshops is understanding um, how to use this information in terms of looking at total amount of vulnerability and risk or proportion of, of the assets that are affected. And so that's what the percentages show, the percentages of the assets that are exposed and potentially affected by these climate threats. So this, the whole step two process of assessing vulnerability and risk is really um, providing this foundation to start investigating options to build resilience. And so that takes us into the step three of the process of considering options uh, to reduce vulnerability and risk and to build resilience. And there's four main categories of types of options that um, that do this. And so the first one is options that reduce exposure. And so that's removing assets from harm's way. The second is increasing adaptive capacity. So of vulnerable areas or vulnerable assets, how could you increase the adaptive capacity so that asset would better cope with the threat if it were to occur? The third one is supporting response and recovery. And so this is working with emergency management um, or a response uh, plan if the threat were to occur. And the fourth is mitigating the future change and the risk associated with future change. So those are the four types of options that are generally uh, investigated. And the last step that we work with the communities on is prioritizing actions. And so taking these options and then evaluating uh, them according to different criteria. And so in this case, this is showing what we call a green light, red light approach to um, and the rows are different options. And so the different criteria here are ability to increase resilience, the economic feasibility of that option, what the environmental impact of the option would be, and the actual ability to implement. And so a red is showing that you know, really don't have the ability to implement a couple of these options here in this case. And this is something that we're still working with the city of Asheville on doing. So in summary, um, Hopefully, I was able to provide a little bit of a highlight of how um, we're applying these conceptual frameworks of vulnerability and risk at the very local scale and how this GIS platform allows us to do this and do it in an easily updated way. And so with the database views and structure of the PostGIS database, um, these parcel, you know, while the asset information can be updated and these views um, happen within a few minutes um, of us updating that data. And so it allows us to change and update that data uh, pretty frequently if we want to. By providing different um, scales information, we're able to support planning at multiple scales as well. And of course, being able to integrate with existing plans. And so as far as next steps, we're working to expand um, this planning process to work with some Piedmont, Piedmont communities and coastal regions in North Carolina, and also integrating this with 3D. So being able to visualize vulnerability and risk at, with 3D models. So definitely want to give a special thanks to the city of Asheville and also the Southeast Sustainability Directors Network um, in working us through the last couple of years. I also want to give a plug to our intern, William Clark. Um, he'll be giving another talk tomorrow. He is one of the uh, Herb Stout uh, Student Award winners. So definitely want to give a plug for his talk uh, tomorrow morning in the 8.30 session. Um, he'll be talking more about what he's done to support this uh, work as well. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, well, uh, 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 sure. Yeah. I was just wondering if you also were looking at trying to integrate um, time into this, you know, over the years, how things would change uh, to make it worse or better at, you know, in your assessment. Have you I think that's part of the future change um, I talked about. And so we're looking at trends of 
like heavy precipitation events and how those are projected to change going forward, but also development, you know, it's a non-climate stressor entering into the equation of how the city is thinking it is going to develop in the future, you know, looking out 25 to 30 years. And so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the question was about um, the scenario of wildfire, given you know, the recent wildfire season that we had, especially in West North Carolina. Um, so it's interesting, the, um, that's definitely a big interest of the city, given the season that we just had. You know, in the assessment, it's really interesting, you know, the, for residential areas, or residential properties, um, wildfire is the, the greatest exposure. And so their most properties are exposed to wildfire more than any other threat. It's not necessarily the highest risk or the most vulnerable, um, but it is the highest exposure. So there's the most potential for wildfire entering into residential areas than any of the other threats that we've looked at. And there's seven threats total. Um, so that is one that the city's looking at. Yeah. Any others? Thank you very much. All right. Thanks.